Disclaimer, I do not own the rights of any of the videos, images, or sounds other than my own voice that will be portrayed in this video. Everything you will see is for documentary purposes only and is protected under the Fair Use Act of 1976. For every movie that blows us away, each one that wins the biggest awards, the films that become the most revered, there seem to be just as many that get recounted as being the worst receiving terrible critical reviews and audience reactions being less than favorable, a film to hit the peak of being bad is not something actors, directors, producers, or even the film crew ever expect when putting in the hard work and financial investment to create a film. What's even more interesting is the behind the scenes stories that we can find which add to the tale of how the film led to being a letdown. Documentaries and biopics showing us the highlights of how a film made its way into the dark spotlight of negative film infamy. This Ain't No Video Game is a 2014 doc about the making of the critically bad 1993 video game adaptation of The Super Mario Brothers. The Disaster Artist from 2017 is a biopic based on the novel of the same name telling the story of the making of The Room from 2003. One of the worst films in history that has so many intriguing stories revolving around it. The novel was written by Greg Sestero, the actor who starred alongside Tommy Wiseau in the film. There are a lot of examples to this idea, but one that stands out the most would have to be Best Worst Movie from 2009 a documentary featuring the cast and crew of the amazingly horrible 1990 film, Troll 2. Troll 2 has found a cult following as it has made its mark in film history. It gives the it's so bad it's good moniker a run for its money. The documentary is directed by Michael Stevenson, who played the role of Joshua, the main protagonist of the film. It reveals what it's like for the cast members now, what the intention of the film was in the long run, and what it's like for them 20 years after the film's release. This is one of the few times they made a documentary regarding how bad the sequel to a film was, and how it landed its title of worst film ever. This film takes up so much of the limelight that most people forget the film that came before it, Troll from 1986. It isn't better than Troll 2 by any means, but it's interesting to look back on and see the story of Troll and how, if given a chance, maybe it could be re-looked at for some consideration as a decent dark fantasy film, considering the year it came out. There is a treasure trove of B and C level films from the 80s that could be held up to the microscope to see some value in what they had to offer. This is probably the biggest era that the cult following for films comes from. Labyrinth, released that same year, is a widely popular film now. But when it was released, it would shock most to see that it was financially unsuccessful and the reviews are average to say the least. But ask any diehard fan and its impression can definitely be felt even today, more than 30 years after it came out. But at that time, it was just alright. Now to be frank, this isn't to say that Troll should be on the same level as Labyrinth, but to show that when most think about Labyrinth, they don't think of the negative reception from when it was released. Troll 2 is in a world all of its own, and it makes audiences forget about Troll. When you re-watch it today, there is a few things that most would find enjoyable about it. The film is directed by John Carl Buchler, who is known mostly for his special effects work on films such as Reanimator and Ghoulies. This film is his second directorial attempt, as his first was 1984's The Dungeon Master which he also did the special effects for. You can actually see a poster for that film in the son's room during a few of the scenes during Troll. Buchler would also go on to direct Cellar Dweller in 1988, as well as do the special effects. He is a prominent figure in the horror film realm, but he has no attachment to Troll 2, despite being behind the creation of the Troll itself. The plot of Troll revolves around a family who move into a new apartment complex where, unbeknownst to them, the Troll resides. There is no explanation as to why they move there, but within the first few scenes, the troll is revealed as he snatches the daughter away into the shadows and takes over her identity. It won't be until much later in the film you find out if the daughter is captured or if she was killed, because all you can assume with that first scene is that the troll might have killed her or ate her. 
or any number of things because there is no precedent set yet to what the troll is capable of. Then there is some minor character introductory scenes to show some of the other residents of the building, introducing the quirky personalities that the film is going to portray. The womanizer who lives upstairs, the military guy across the hall who's always working out, the old lady who complains about everything, typical horror film trope character traits. Now the family is made up of Michael Moriarty as the father, who you might recognize from films of that era such as The Stuff and Q. Shelley Hack, who had a supporting role in The King of Comedy with Robert De Niro the year prior. Jenny Beck, who plays the daughter, surprisingly enough had a very short-lived film career, only doing four films, Troll being her third. But what the film really had going for it is the son played by Noah Hathaway, who was just coming off the massive success of his role as Atreyu in 1984's The NeverEnding Story, where he would win a Saturn Award for Best Performance by a Young Actor. They played the role of the Potter family. Noah Hathaway's character of the son was named Harry Potter Jr., as the father's name was Harry Potter. This is 1986, four years before J.K. Rowling had started working on the first novel and nearly a decade before it would be published. This film would also get supporting roles from Sonny Bono, who played the promiscuous upstairs neighbor, Phil Vandacaro, who played a neighbor that befriends the little girl while also putting on the suit and portraying the troll itself for the film. But most notable of all would have to be the debut of Julia Louis-Dreyfus, who recent fans know of her role in the MCU, others of her successful series Veep, but she would go on to be iconically known as Elaine Bennis in the hit series Seinfeld. As the story progresses, only young Harry can see that there is something wrong with his sister, as she goes around infecting the other neighbors with a magical ring that turns them into portals for his world to come through. Harry befriends the old lady neighbor who turns out to be a powerful sorcerer, and she explains to him who the troll is and that he is also a powerful wizard who is seeking revenge. He took the side of the trolls during a war between them and humans and because of this betrayal, he was turned into a troll for eternity. He plans to have his world become reborn through these magical portals, and he must create these portals in all of the apartments in the complex. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why this particular apartment complex? Well, that's never explained. Why is he trying to do this now? This is apparently a special time of the year that gives him three days to complete the transformation. Otherwise, he'll never have another chance again. Torok has just three days in which to complete his universe. Or else he misses his cosmic chance. He's running out of time and apartments. The old woman fails to hold him off, leaving young Harry to save the day and his sister. To say the least, the story has a copious amount of flaws. But looking at its premise, with some retweaks to certain plot points, this has the potential of being a good story. It's a very basic fairy tale that portrays overcoming the odds and defeating evil. There is something to take from it as it sits now that could be enjoyable. Someone did see that because a remake was in the works around the early 2000s. But of course, there were issues with the use of the name Harry Potter. These delays were not encouraging, and unfortunately, Bushler, the creator, was diagnosed with cancer, and this would lead to the complete cancellation of the remake altogether. So a few years after Troll, the sequel would come out. However, Troll 2 isn't even really a sequel. It was originally meant to be titled Goblins, and had a completely different production path, only until distributors wanted to relabel it as a sequel. The creatures in the film aren't meant to be trolls. That's why they don't look the same. They're goblins. This was confirmed by writer and director Claudio Vacasso. There are two other films considered to be sequels that are connected to Troll. Quest for the Mighty Sword, released in 1990, and The Crawlers, released in 1991. None of these films have any actual connection, but they are both still considered Troll 3 at sort of the same time. Which makes no sense, and it's unfortunate that there is all of this confusion revolving around this film that unfortunately leaves it floating deeper into nothingness. As time goes on, it's slowly being forgotten. And that's upsetting when you consider that Troll is the first full-length film to feature and be solely about trolls in all of cinema history. All there is before this is a segment in the 1985 film Cat's Eye, 
Trolls would pop up sporadically throughout film history, and depictions of them are used in various forms of fantasy and fairy tale storytelling. But this film is one of a kind, and it is unique, and it should be treated as such. Not just to be overshadowed by the confusing sequels that aren't even really sequels, but even more so, the actual named sequel doesn't have anything to do with it. It's a shame that Troll 2 has such a status among the film world that Troll doesn't get any attention. Hopefully, they put the remake back on the table and change whatever is needed to greenlight redoing this story, perhaps even modernizing it, making it more fun, just so it has a chance again to not be correlated with an infamously bad sequel. Maybe one day. Until then, here's Harry Potter dancing. Summertime blue.